Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Fred. Fred, it's a pleasure to have you on my show. Can you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Uh, thanks very much, Robbie. My name is Fred Anskin, um, and I teach uh, contemporary history and politics at Birkbeck University of London. Um, but my main research interest is on the Ottoman Empire and what comes after the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans and the Middle East. Um, so I'm happy to talk about some really Anything, anything you're, that that strikes your fancy that you're curious about, because I'm sure I'm sure there's I'm sure there's lots that uh, yeah you've heard bits of and 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 uh, want to follow up on. Yeah, it's I mean it's definitely an area in history. I feel like I wasn't probably taught more about, and I I don't think probably a lot of Americans, especially, get a lot of time spent into the Ottoman Empire unless they go research it after they get out of school or something like that as like a course or a graduate. So I'm just curious, what is the Ottoman Empire and why is it so significant? Okay, the Ottoman Empire was a state which um, uh, lasted for about 600 years, from maybe 1300 to 1922. Uh, it was centered in what is now Turkey, but Turkey is a different country. Uh, it covered about territory that's now in about 30 different nation states. Um, so you, you're talking about a large chunk, the majority of the Mediterranean, uh, the Balkans, a good, a, a large part of Eastern Europe, all around the Black Sea and across the Middle East, all those are former former Ottoman territories, and the Ottomans did have a a role in shaping the modern world in the in those areas. So, um, uh, yeah, I think it, it in in world history it was a tremendous power for a long time. Well, what led to its downfall if it was so superior for over six hundred years? Um, it's, uh, <laughs> that's a, it's a complicated question. I would say the simple answer is that, um, it's near neighbor Europe, um, underwent the industrial revolution, underwent a uh, rapid, you know, a military revolution in the 18th century where it became just very good at fighting. Um, and the Ottomans had a, had a hard time keeping up. And ultimately, it was just that they were outgunned. They were they had a huge territory to defend, but uh, actually pretty sparsely settled. So they didn't have a, have enough in the way of manpower. A um, lot of not a lot of natural resources as well. So industrially, they were behind places like Britain, France, Russia, um, and ultimately, they they just could not survive pressure from from Europe. It was really that external pressure which brought them to an end. But it was a process that lasted from the you know eight, from the seventeen sixties up until night, the nineteen twenties. So it was it, it was a draw, it was a drawn out death. Yeah, it was a relatively successful run from what I've heard about it. And then I'm, I see it just collapse in a matter of a couple of years. And my only thought was it had to be from expanding out too much. It seemed like they had a lot of ground to cover and maybe not enough troops to be able to cover all that ground. But I mean, just from learning about the Industrial Revolution, if you learn how, I guess, controversial that topic is, I mean, everyone's got different sides. Like, it's a great era of innovation. And then other people are like, it was terrible because all these factories and it was like where business started to take over. And I'm like, I didn't realize how important like. I guess economics or just you know the financial stuff was to a lot of things yeah well that yeah it, the industrial revolution is is a, is part of a larger package of just states growing a lot more powerful in europe uh in in britain in france um the austrian empire russia uh what became germany yeah they 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 all made um uh, tremendous advances on the economic level, and with that came along advances in, in collecting revenue. They became richer. They were able to, 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 to fund larger armies, equip them, keep them in the field longer than the Ottomans ever could. 
Uh, so that's what the you know, shorthand for the industrial rev revolution happening in the West and not in the East. That's what it really means when it comes to survival of a state like the Ottomans. They just, they, 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 they just couldn't keep up. When it comes to the Ottoman Empire, what, what exactly what were they? I mean, were there were there positives of it? Like, did we look at it in history as like a positive thing the Ottoman Empire was, or was it just kind of this tyrannical thing? Because that's like what you learn about histories. There's always the enemies and there's always like the heroes, but you know, the history books are written by the winners. So I just like seeing the perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, when when you when you asked me, I was wondering what negative aspect of the Ottoman uh, Empire would be coming up. Uh, because that is the way that most people hear about it. Um, and my take would be that the Ottoman state was actually um, quite mainstream, which means that it was you know, good at some things, bad at other things, and uh, things varied over time as well. There were, there were, there were long stretches where um, the government or the state actually ruled very well uh, in a pretty tolerant uh, sort of way, um, meaning in a in a live and let live kind of, of way, and other times when uh, there were tensions uh, in government that played out in in how the the state managed the population, where things were a lot tougher, uh, where there was a, there was there were moves to do things outside of the the legal system. Uh, do things, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a totally autocratic sort of way. On the whole, between, you know, across 600 years, I would say the majority of the time, the government, the state, tended more towards that um, uh, predictable, sustainable, relatively light touch kind of approach. Um, and uh, over the course of that 600 years, there was, there was, relatively little resistance to the to the to the state and their population seemed to be um pretty satisfied uh so in that sense you could say that you know good rule is boring but it's also beneficial uh there is there is internal development social development as well as economic development that comes out as a result of that that tends to be forgotten and what people do tend to focus upon are the violent episodes, which usually came along when the empire was uh, drawing to a close. Well, how important is the community aspects in the Ottoman Empire? I mean, we got tensions today. Mostly everyone wants to tear up their government because there's just like a lack of mistrust there. And I'm like, I mean, if you look at a, a light touch regulation with the government, I mean, does it work? Is it, is it effective? Is it something, I mean, you don't want to be so involved into your people, but I also think like we're in a weird part today where religion's not as powerful as it was before. And that was like, you look at a lot of these ancient civilizations, there's this relationship between community and religion and the government's not super heavily involved, even though there is a presence of government there, but there's not a lot of pressure on them as much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, it it's important to keep to keep in mind that the state today, be it the in, the government in the U.S. or or, or here in Britain, um, the state today is interested in a lot more things, has its hand in a lot more things than was the case a couple hundred years ago. Um, and I think the the reasons for that are ultimately you know originally military as well, but but um, I, I won't go down that road at the moment. But um, I mean one of in thinking about the Ottomans from 1300 up until well into the 19th century, they could afford to be, or they were naturally inclined to be light touch because they were really only interested in uh, a, a pretty limited number of things. They were interested in military powers so that they could keep the peace at home and they could fight against um, enemies abroad, whether that was offensive or defensive, it varied. They were interested in um, you know, keep, you know, upholding justice, you know, a, a legal system and a system for resolving disputes to keep the population satisfied. Uh, so that's a, that's a matter of, of a legal system and policing. And they were interested in taxation. And beyond that, they were pretty content to let communities be self-managing. And the, and the, and the, and, and one, Thing that I might, um, you know, want to nitpick with you 
is what exactly the fundamental community was because on on it, it operated on different levels there was a there were there were different faiths in the population the ottoman empire was an islamic state and muslims always were regarded as being the best of the population you know some were some were members of the ruling class the majority of them were uh were not they paid taxes as well and and um yeah, they didn't have didn't have a huge amount of power but still they were regarded under the legal system as being um advantaged but there was also protection built in for the other religious communities who the majority of whom were orthodox christians uh but jews as well and a relatively small number but still noticeable of catholics so it was a, it was a it was a multi-religious population and people of different faiths were in were you know classed together as part of a faith community which stressed, stretched across the empire but when it came to people's daily lives, it was the local community that really mattered. And um, in in very few places in the Ottoman Empire were there community, local communities that didn't involve people of more than one faith. Uh, so you had Muslims and, and, and Orthodox and Jews living um, you know, in quite close proximity to each other and interacting daily. And the bonds that came from those daily interactions are really the things that govern life. And when I say the state was pretty happy to let communities be self-governing, that's really what I'm talking about is those local communities, as long as they didn't, as long as no problems came up, uh, internal conflicts, um, the government was, was pretty happy to let local communities um, manage their own affairs you know, as they saw fit according to local custom. Did that make a successful community, just the amount of religious, I guess, diversity that was out there? Because, I mean, those were always things we couldn't talk about at the dinner table. You can't talk about politics and you can't talk about religion. And now it's like, it's like nobody even really talks about religion anymore. But the ones we always know of, at least from talking to people that study like the Vikings and everything, I mean, the Vikings coming over and learning about Christianity and then that whole thing where they were kind of flamed out in a sense because Christianity was so powerful. We always think that like Christianity and being Catholic was like the dominant ones. But Islam is like this one that I'm very, very new on. I don't know a whole lot about islam i think i have maybe a friend who's islamic but i mean if you're looking at the ottoman empire and the success of 600 years not just on the government capabilities but you need your people to be happy you need your people to not be riding in the streets and fighting and if it's the communities that are somehow working together well then what's the beneficial aspect of the communities where's that commonality where people are able to get along without you know stabbing or trying to murder each other Okay, well, uh, you froze up slightly on slightly on me there, but I think I got your question. Um, when it comes to uh, local communities, and 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 um, you know, I said that they they tended to be of more than one faith, a population made up of of Muslims, Christians, and Jews. Um, and one thing again, it's 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 good to step away from the way we think of things today just like we're thinking about how the state works and what the state's interested in. Now, if you say that, that um, or if, if I were to say Muslims, Christians, and Jews really don't have all that much in common, and they're naturally inclined to be antagonistic to each other, you know, I can't say you're wrong, but um, you dig down a little further and, and, and you realize that actually it's more, there's more to it than that. Because if you talk about Christianity, which Christianity are you talking about? Um, there's no, yeah, there's, there, there, there's a core that may be shared amongst all Christians, but there's a huge amount of variety as well. Uh, you know, you, you, you can, you compare a, uh, uh, an Episcopalian to a Baptist in the U S and, and, uh, you know, they, they, they have some things in common, but there are some really sharp differences as well. Catholic versus Orthodox, all, all sorts of variations. And you see those kinds of variations in other faiths as well. It's inevitable when you're talking about communities that include millions of people. So there, there, there's a stereotype or an image of what Islam is and what it stands for when it comes to dealing with Christians and Jews. And there's a little bit of a, a stereotype of what, as well about how Christians deal with, with Muslims or with Islam, how Jews deal with Islam. Um, and the day-to-day -day reality tends to be much more complex. 
So um, there were a lot of shared elements at the local level because you're talking really about folk religion. And there's a lot of borrowing and adapting that goes on. Um, so Islam in the Balkans uh, probably has more in common with Christianity in the Balkans than it does with uh, Islam in, in, say, what's now Saudi Arabia. Um, yeah, you know, I could, I could, I could argue about that with, 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 with people, but um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to argue. I'm still new to it. I'm just wondering because, like, we got all these. If you got a bunch of communities that are all different types of religions, I mean, that's a topic that even today. I mean, like I said, Islam for over here, we're not. That's not a Western culture thing. I guess that's more of an Eastern culture thing. So I'm still new to that. But I mean. You got to think if you're in a community, you're living next to your neighbor it really doesn't matter what their religion is in a sense. I mean, in certain obviously it depends where you're from. There are some areas where people wouldn't even associate because of the religion. But you get to this point where like you guys are surviving, especially that early on where you guys are surviving together and you're living in the same community. You have to get to know your neighbor because they also are a key to your survival as well, too. I mean, I would I would fight the argument that the interactions today that we have through the cell phone have completely diminished our capacity for community value. And I think that's an important aspect because that's how you get along. It's how you end up surviving a little bit longer, which is interesting because if you look at, like I said, the Ottoman Empire 600 years or so, I mean, if you have different religions, are they fighting each other? Are they really worried about each other or are they communicating and they're surviving at least? I mean, it doesn't have to be great survival, but they're surviving. And I mean, that's a crucial aspect to a civilization's length, not only the military aspect, but the community aspect. Yeah, well, you're, you're right. Um, and, um, you know, you, you, you and I you know, today, we're, we're, we're talking, we're, int we're interacting in a certain kind of way because of the, of the time in which we live. And, and we don't know each other personally. And, and, and so there are just a handful of things that we gauge each other by. Uh, but if you're living next door to somebody and you see him every day and you're saying, you know, you, 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 you stop and you gossip and, and uh, you know, you pick up some shopping for me, who, who, who knows what it, does, what it is, but there's day to day interaction. And it's uh, in a lang it's in, the lo in a local dialect that everybody understands. Um, and the Muslim who lives next door to you, if you're a Christian, uh, the Muslim may be. You know, a, a convert who you know, 10 years before was a Christian as well, or his, his or her father was. Um, you know, there's, there, there are a lot of commonalities which link people together and allow them to, to interact on that local level, uh, which is why for most of the Ottoman period, you don't have that kind of ongoing endemic low level uh, fighting, you know, whether it's verbal or, or physical, going on between people who are of different faiths. Towards the last couple of years of the Ottoman Empire, did you come across anything where the communities were separating? Yeah, at that's all? the secret, I think, to, to the fact that the well, 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 yes, yes. So, so, so there's cooperation, and and there are plenty of cases <laughs> of uh, people who marry across uh, religious lines, and um, um, it, you know. A non-Muslim cannot marry a Muslim girl, or a, Mus a Muslim woman, but the opposite happens. A, a Muslim man can marry a, a Christian or a, a Jewish woman, um, uh, whether they change their faith or not. They, you know, such marriages are, are, are permitted. Um, uh, and that does happen. There, you know, clearly, there is social interaction that, that, that goes on all the time. Um, and, and that's where I think you know, most of the popu Muslim population in the Balkans, which up until the 19th century was a really large part of the Balkan population, the Muslims were, um, you know, that's where, they, that's where they come from, from that kind of, of um, you know, local interaction, which, which convinces people that actually, you know, changing, changing faith is not a, um, does not mean I will lose my, my community. Um, so that that leads to stability, but I mean, you you make you make a good point about, uh, about the possibility of conflict as well, and where you where conflict happens, I think I think is tied to a couple of uh, important um, influences. One is during wartime when the Ottomans 
as a Muslim power are fighting against a Christian, uh, a Christian power and are losing, uh, then you can see a lot of suspicion about, well, are local Christians going to welcome the Austrians or the Russians when they show up? Uh, and if if they're willing to welcome the, the foreign power, does that mean they're going to be trying to sabotage us at home? So there is there is suspicion um, uh, at time at times like that. The other way in which I think there's a um, uh, really really good source of of tension and conflict is when people are forced to move. So refugees. Um, towards the, you know, the last century of the existence of the Ottoman Empire, the borders were being pushed in. There were a lot of refugees, and refugees don't have anything at stake in trying in in disrupting that local um, local sense of community that goes across religious lines. They they come in. They've been pushed out of their territory because they were Muslim, and they are going to be antagonistic towards people who they see only by that label of, well, they're Christian, Orthodox Christian, whatever it may be, and they will be suspicious, antagonistic as a result. Um, so the more people move, the more unstable society as a whole becomes, and the more you'll see those kinds of religious tensions bubbling up and, 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 and really, in some cases, um, uh, leading, leading to, to, to really brutal um, killing of each other. That's kind of the question I was going for there was you can annihilate an empire, you can destroy them basically military wise or another power comes in, but to truly take them off of the face of whatever their existence would be to, in, or I guess, incentivize whatever is left of the population that are part of that empire to fight amongst each other to where they completely are divided amongst to a point where there's no, there's no shreds left. Because if you wipe out an empire, those people are still part of that empire. They don't just change sides and all that. And it's actually an interesting point um, or interesting question is when you mentioned that like a Christian power coming over. I would think that if you are Christian and you are living, even if it's your empire that's being attacked, are you still thinking like home team advantage? Are you still part of the civilization or the empire? Are you still thinking in that mindset like a football team? Yeah, I mean, if you're not from Baltimore, you're probably not going to be worshiping the Baltimore Ravens. But if you transfer over to that, do you still maintain that quality of faith, I would say, in your team? Or do you just change because there's now an overcoming number of another team coming in? which brings in the aspect of like when the community gets completely divided. I mean, are they looking at it? Like I'm not thinking in the eyes of the Ottoman empire anymore. I'm now thinking that there's a Christian power trying to come over here and I kind of want that to happen. So now you're losing your home field advantage idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it, it, the way you do get, you do get a, a, a really sort of general, um, social breakdown when a territory is invaded whether the whether the invading army stays or not there you know, there, there there is a, a real social breakdown because people are uprooted the invading army has a tendency to you know, the austrians coming in through um what's now yugoslavia they 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 would have been automatically favoring catholics where they found them but also Orthodox Christians against Muslims. Uh, and they swept through that area several times in the, in, in the 18th century and uprooted people. Uh, so there were you know, Christians and Muslims um, you know, as refugees moving across the territory. And as they moved, they just uh, uh, unsettled everything. The vast majority of people, I would say, um, uh, until such time that they were uprooted, uh, it didn't matter hugely to them who was ruling them. Um, it, yeah, you you accept who you're ruling. I mean, that's that that's tradition. That's the way it was under your under your your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents. Um, uh, are you going to to, to fight against it, um, knowing that if you take up arms to try and you know, bring about the end of that? system of rule, there's a very good chance you're going to die. Probably not. Uh, and also because you don't know what's going to come in to replace it. Is it going to be any better? Um, and again, yeah, most people would, would be 
small C conservative. They 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 go with what they know, and and they're not going to you know, push for the end of of the Ottoman system that had been in place for a long for a long time. It was predictable, and most of the time uh, was tolerable. Um, but you know, once that once once the armies start marching through, um, yeah, it's 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 um, tough to know which way things are going to go, and everybody gets to be extremely nervous. Which is which is where, which is which is where a lot of that you know, you know, then rolling violence comes in. What changed after the Ottoman Empire collapsed? Like, did you trace what occurrences or what changes happened after they were just gone? Did you look to see what changed religious wise? Was there giant sections or areas where people were becoming way more Christian than it was before, or maybe it was a minority now becoming more of a? Because, like I said, it's a that's a powerful religion, at least from my eyes, because I'm a younger generation kind of looking at. It. I don't really know the historical record of, you know, how far it goes back. Obviously, it's old, but that's the one you're raised upon. It's the one you're taught about, and we don't, like I said, we don't hear anything about Islam. Yeah. Um, yeah. Up until the 20th century, secularism just wasn't much of an option, you know, or atheism wasn't an option. Everybody, everybody had a religion, and everybody, everybody believed. If you have, if you have a belief, yeah, you, 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 you live by it. You accept it. You don't want to piss off God. Um, would be, would be a, um, you know, kind of scandalous uh, shorthand for for the attitude. Um, you know, it's it, it. So people, people were people who were Muslim uh, felt that as a as a fundamental element of, of who they were. That was that was the source of their belief system. That was the source of their sense of what's right and what's wrong. But Christians, both Catholics and Orthodox, Armenians, they they all had uh, that same depth of feeling, that same depth of attachment, uh, and Jews as well. It, it, it was it was a it was a fact of life. Just as it was in in Europe um, until some point, probably after the First World War, and uh, Europe was an incredibly thoroughly Christian place, uh, and it still is in a, in a way that, oddly enough, the U.S. isn't. Um, uh, you know, in officially as well as 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 in terms of um, strength of feeling, very religious place. Uh, so, what happens when the Ottoman, when Ottoman rule ends? And then you really have to differentiate between what territories you're talking about. Um, if you're talking about the Balkans, or if you're talking about the Middle East, or you're talking about um, uh, Anatolia, a territory that's now part of Turkey, you know, what comes afterwards, it, it differs from place to place. <coughs> In the Balkans, um, uh, you know, in, at no, in no place would I say in the Balkans or actually anywhere does Ottoman rule collapse. The Ottomans never lose any territory just by, by collapse. They are always pushed out of territory militarily or, or diplomatically with, with military backing. They're pushed out of every square inch of territory that they lose. Um, and it's always to the um you know the 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 same powers it's 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 russia austria france and and britain and those powers with germany going along with it uh those powers when it came to europe wanted would not uh accept i would say a a muslim power a muslim state succeeding the ottoman empire uh, it either had to be an, an explicitly Christian state, and and all the all the states in the Balkans, so Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia, uh, Macedonia, Croatia, Romania, um, they are all states which are created by the great powers of Europe. Those five I mentioned: um, uh, Russia, Austria, France, Britain, with Germany thrown in. They all create the, the modern map of the Balkans, and they do it explicitly for the Christians of those popula uh, uh, Christian population of those territories. Now, in some cases, the Muslim population was pushed out uh, at the time at time of conquest, or there was all sorts of bureaucratic ways and, and legal ways of, of putting pressure on Muslims to leave. 
So, um, you know, the, the majority of the Muslim population of the Balkans either died or emigrated during the 19th and early 20th century. And what happens in, in Turkey, uh, what becomes Turkey after 1922, um, is, you know, is the flip side of that. All non-Muslims are kicked out or killed. Um, what you have is, is, is then nation states created, which are built upon a, a sense of religious identity, um, to which is then married a, a sense of ethnicity, which all has to be developed after the Ottoman Empire. In the Middle East, in places like Syria, Iraq, and, and, and so forth, um, and the, the Ottomans are, are driven out uh, during the First World War, and then it's the British and the French that replace them, uh, and in North Africa as well. <laughs> and the British and the French do things a little bit differently uh, in their parts of, of, of the Middle East. Uh, Britain, you know, at least maintains a facade of not trying to change too much. Um, whereas the French are, are much more explicitly interested in boosting the interests of, of Christian populations, which is really where you get the state of Lebanon from. It's a, it's a state created for the Catholics of Catholic um, uh, Christians of the Maronites of, of, of Lebanon. Um, uh, so that's a, that's, a, that's a somewhat different fate from what happens in, in, in Turkey or in the Balkans. Um, the only thing they have in common really is that that religious sense of identity for the community above the local, above the locale that you live in, that religious sense it, you know, is still strong at the end of the Ottoman Empire. It, it's what happens after it, building up a national identity to go along with it that, um, you know, again, goes in different directions, depending on which part of the territory you're talking about. How like how linked in is that with trade? Because like if you're looking at like all the major cultural powers or the main dominant powers, the country powers, um, if you ask what religion they would be, a lot of them would be like Christian or that type of Catholic. And then it seems like if you have this what is now a minority, I would say religion or I mean, atheism is probably now more dominant than anything. Um, Despite what people think, I, I, I think that used to be like a science term. Like if you were atheist, you were a scientist. Now it's like, that's, that's pretty, that's more common. But I mean, if we talk about like the tie in with trade, I mean, are more powers like the French because they want more Christian populations or they're more willing to trade with Christian populations compared to maybe one of a Muslim. I mean, that's an important factor to a country's survival. If you need an essential trading relationship or a good relationship, you got to think who you're going to piss off. Like when I started learning about trade, I started learning like when someone makes a transaction, it's not just I give you these goods and you give me your goods. There's like, OK, if I trade with you, I know you're not friends with that guy and that guy's a friend of mine. And it's like, is that going to mess up relationships there? And you start wondering, I mean, people identify not just with their political party, they identify with their religion as well, too. So if you're trading with someone that's on the opposite religion um, and you have a friend maybe that sees that, they might get upset that you're trading with someone from an opposite religion. Um, yeah, uh, there, there, there are a couple of things to, to say. First of which is to agree with what you just said. I about to say I thought it was a dumb question. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, it's not. Um, uh, if I if I forget to to get back to the to, to the other thing, which I have to say, uh, it would go a little bit or, or or make it less important. I think. But yeah, all through the time that the Ottoman Empire existed, uh, you know, a lot of its relations with Christian Europe were you know to do with fighting, but there were also long periods of, of peace or truce. And uh, in those time periods, there was a lot of trade that went on. Um, and in most cases, it was a matter of Christian merchants coming to the Ottoman Empire and um, you know, finding, finding goods uh, to export back home. And the ones they tended to deal with were other Christians, um, possibly Jews, but, but, but they did tend to avoid dealing with Muslims. And there were some very good reasons for that, practical reasons for that. But the, but there is a, a fundamental one of, um, you know, you, if you're dealing with people, you want to be dealing with people who share the same values you do. And, and religion is, a, is, as I said before, is the source of your sense of what's right and what's wrong. 
Uh, so if you're a Christian trader, you deal with, with uh, local Christians who are middlemen or actually are merchants themselves because you're kind of on the same page about that sense of, of what is right and what is wrong. And if you get into a dispute with them, you can solve it um, either within you know, the, you know, your, your country's consular court um, you know, your, your diplomatic representation is really about looking after commercial interests and, and um, uh, you can have commercial affairs heard by your local consul. Um, uh, so there's, there's dispute re resolution in which you're going to be on, on equal terms and equal footing with the Ottoman subject uh, or citizen who is also a Christian. Um, if you're if you're dealing with a Muslim, the Muslim would probably, if there's a dispute, want to take it to um, uh, an Islamic court. In which case, uh, there is an, a, you know, it's it's to his advantage against yours. Uh, so there there's a there's a very good rational reason for that kind of keep it within the religious family approach to to commerce. Um, so you see that, as I say, all the all the way through the the existence of the Ottoman Empire, uh, commerce between Europe and and the Middle East is largely in the hands of of Christians, uh, and to some extent Jews. Um, the you know Mus Muslims tend not to be welcome in Europe; they have a hard time um, establishing themselves for any length of time um, in European ports. <coughs> They try occasionally, but it tends not to last. Now, getting back to the to, to the to the other point, uh, which maybe speaks a little bit to um, why those great powers of Europe were interested in what happened what happens to the Middle East and to the Balkans, and and how much is it that there's commercial interest involved? There is commercial interest involved, but I think for um, most of Europe, what the Middle East has to offer commercially is actually not terribly important. Um, I said the Ottoman Empire covers territory in 30 plus countries now, um, but it was relatively sparsely populated. And a lot of it has to do with natural resources. It, it's, it, it's, a, it's a place where, where water is scarce. Uh, mineral resources are, are, are relatively scarce compared to, to Europe. Until the discovery of oil, uh, you know, when you think about commerce coming out of the Middle East today, after you after you think of oil and gas, what what is there to think of? It, yeah, the, it it doesn't have a huge amount that is tremendously valued or or needed by uh, by Europe by the by the rest of the world. Um, so the the volume of trade is not so great that it's going to to lead to the British, the French, the Russians to try and move in just for commercial interests. That just ten, tends to, to reinforce, you know, other imperial interests and 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 um, religious solidarity. How important was the value of water as a resource to them? Like, did they did they keep those more protected? Because I would have to think that if you have this giant empire, I mean, they probably have some places that are covered near water for trading purposes and probably because it's just an essential thing. And then if that's overtaken first, I bet you see that dramatic decrease in the Ottoman Empire's territory just significantly go up because if you lose that water resource now, you, you, I mean, what, what else do you have? That's a precious thing. It's like sun and water is like the two things for survival. Yeah. Um, if you look at, look at the, obviously I don't have one here for you, but if you look at a map of the territory that the Ottoman Empire covered, um, you know, the furthest, furthest extent that the Ottoman Empire reached in Europe was the gates of Vienna, which which they attacked twice, or they besieged Vienna twice, in the, once in the 16th, once in, once in the 17th century. <coughs> Between Vienna and Istanbul, um, you know, until the 20th century, there were no large cities. Probably the probably the only one that really mattered was was Belgrade, in Serbia. Um, in you know across the rest of the Balkan Peninsula, it's all it, it is very mountainous. There is some good soil. Uh, it's relatively rich, 
in that sense, uh, you know, productive, um, but it's not easy to control. So settlement tends to be spread out. Uh, there aren't huge cities. Uh, Istanbul is a huge city, and it's a huge city because it has a supply of drinking water, uh, and it is on the on important waterways um, from the Aegean uh, and Mediterranean into the Black Sea. Uh, it's also the linking point between uh, Asia and Europe. Um, it's a major communications highway, uh, and you can't take water out of that equation. And then once you get beyond Istanbul and, and head into Asia, you don't find another big city until you get you know, the only other really big city that would rival Istanbul in that entire you know, expanse of the Ottoman Empire was Cairo. And, and Cairo was um, huge, absolutely huge and incredibly wealthy. Egypt, Egypt was, um, and, and today Egypt is, it naturally is the most important country in the Arab world because of population, because of uh, agricultural productivity. Um, it's now culturally the capital of the, of the Middle East as well. And the, or, you know, there is one word to sum up the, the basis of, of Cairo's and Egypt's importance, and that is the Nile. You know, it's the Nile River. You know, Egypt expands, you know, you want to draw a map of Egypt, you know, you just draw the Nile River and then a, a <laughs> mile on either side of it, and, that, and that's it. Everything else is desert and, and, and has almost nobody in it. Um, it's, it. It's an incredibly densely populated strip of land, and it's all about the water. And there's no place else in the Middle East where, you know, you, you, you find anything similar. Water is um, the prize. When it and, comes... and, 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 you know, they, you know, and, and this is an issue which is still going on. You know, access to water is, is a, a real international problem in the Middle East today. And it's one of the big points of dispute between Israelis and Palestinians um, um, uh, in Israel-Palestine. Well, I... We base a lot of things when it comes to trade off, you know, people like want gold or they want diamonds or they want these like rare things. But like some of the countries that had that were like, give us food, give us water, give us these basics. And like, it's just weird to see that divide between different cultures. Like if you had an abundance of water and abundance of food, what you would see as like a, a penny you would give away to someone who would see it as a million dollars that you're giving them. And what you'd see to them as gems, diamonds, gold, as a million dollars, they saw as a penny because they had such a wealth of that. And it's just interesting to see that weird, it's, it's, we're, I mean, we're all human, but this basic just distinction of where you come from shares this different experience with this resource. And to me, that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's a it's a matter of comparative advantage for every place, isn't it? There are some things which you which you can produce uh, more cheaply than others, and other things which you know are going to be a struggle for you. And um, you know, what, however you look at the Middle East uh, today, I I, I I I look at it with a with a great deal of sympathy because um, in in terms of what it has in natural resources. Uh, it is a relatively a very poor place, and it, you know, at, at at the bottom, at the base of that, all is just the scarcity of water. You know, I don't, I don't know. There, there are very few places in the Middle East where you get reliable rainfall, so you can, you know, you know farming in 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 the U.S. The, you know, the grain belt, you know, it's um, it's because of 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 adequate rainfall uh and uh you know good rivers and 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 aquifers and all all that and you know very few places in the middle east have anything like that which is why you see u.s grain being shipped you know down the mississippi and ending up in 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 saudi arabia you know it's um you know that's that's the way it is and then you then you turn it around and of course uh, you could stick a stick a straw into the ground in Saudi Arabia and suck out oil. Uh, is, so it's so it's easy easy for them to extract in large, um, uh, relatively easy to extract in, in large quantities and, and and sell. You know, not necessarily to us, but there's always a customer for that because their competitive advantage is so so sh so sharp. But that but but you're right. This is this is one of the things that that 
is fascinating and most people just don't think about when it comes to thinking about why is the Middle East the way it is? And uh, compared to Europe, compared to so many other parts of the world, the natural environment is um, just not as, uh, you know, has not been as uh, beneficent as, as it has been elsewhere. Did you have any preconceived notions going into studying about the Ottoman Empire that eventually changed? Like, because even learning more about like the power of religion, like I said, it, my example of today's time of how, how we think of religion is completely different. But throughout history, you can look anywhere. But like I said, the ones you always hear about are Christian and Catholic. But then you start wondering, why do we think of this this way? And it had me looking through history all over the place. I mean, if I could tell you about communism, why are we scared of communism? Look in the 60s. That was the biggest fear. Nobody knew why. Like the biggest question that anybody ever asked was like, well, which communism? And the guy's like, what do you mean? He's like, there's the Russian communism. Then there's the communism in Indonesia. What, which one are you talking about? There's different types now. And they're like, oh, I guess, yeah, there is different types. And it's like, you just start learning about like everything that you're kind of told through the history books necessarily isn't exactly that way. But I mean, I guess it gets into more controversial territory. I'm just wondering if you had any ideas before you went into the subject and they eventually changed over. I mean, for what we just talked about, religion being one of those things. I mean, that's why there's literally cities that are just identified as a religious capital of this certain thing. And there's a reason for that. It's not only identity, but it's the importance of what that means as well, too. Yeah, no, no, you're, you're right. Uh, it's, it's um, you know, as, as I was telling you earlier, I ended up being a, uh, interested in the Ottoman Empire kind of by accident. Um, and it's a it's a matter of uh, there, there there being yeah growing up in the U.S. You, you're not exposed to it really. You, you, you think well, Ottoman Empire, Turkey. Well, who cares? Um, I probably shouldn't have said that, but there it is. Um, uh, compared to what's going on in other parts of the of the Middle East or or the Balkans and the Caucasus and and, and Soviet Union, it's just not all that interesting. And the way it gets it was written about for 100, 150 years or, or, or even longer in Europe, in the West, uh, it all just suggested that, that the Ottoman Empire was nothing about, uh, it was, a, was about nothing but decline. Um, yeah, it was a religious empire, uh, but it was, you know, what really um, you know, characterized it was um, inability to organize itself. It, it just lazy totally totally uh beyond redemption when it came to adopting modernity and so yeah that, that's the sort of things that i was uh, sort of stuff i was reading and being exposed to all the all the way through school whenever the ottomans came up um and i just by kind of force of, of circumstance ended up studying a topic which had to do with the ottomans which led them to a job um, uh, and that that job had as its main qualification an ability to teach Ottoman history, and that that was teaching in the Balkans. Um, and that's really when I became an Ottomanist because I started studying it with a lot more um, uh, intensity than I had before, um, and discovered, you know, the, the, the more the more you dig into it, the deeper you dig, the more you find out. Uh, how that kind of narrative of decline and uh, sclerotic religion, uh, everything else, all those negative things, how that didn't really match up to what was going on on the ground on a day-to-day -day level. It was a vibrant place. And um, I would say that that kind of sense of, well, I, you know, I had no idea, and this is interesting, uh, you know, is, is, is just something which... Um, uh, has built more and more because you're talking about 600 years and there's, there's, there's so little that's known about those 600 years in that broad expanse of territory. So there's always new stuff to be discovered. The more you dig, the more you're going to find out that you had absolutely no idea about. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of you know, intellectual curiosity that's just kept me going um, and, and made me interested in the Balkans as, as, well, as, the, uh, as well as the Middle East. And when it comes to religion, that too, you know, I, I'd absorbed everything about, uh, you know, the, the general American attitude towards Islam when I was growing up. 
um, you know, I was, I was in high school at the time of the Islamic Revolution in Iran. We all knew that was a bad thing. Um, and Islam had to be something that was, you know, frankly, irrational and, uh, you know, a, a medieval ideology applied to the world today. And there was never going to be any happy solution, happy, happy product coming out of that. But then if it's kind of like with Ottoman history, if you start digging into it, you begin to have a, a better appreciation for um, all the subtleties uh, and and um, uh, everything about both belief and practice that doesn't doesn't really fit with that that generic image that um, most Americans had when I was growing up and and probably still do. Um, so that's that that's that's a you know, I've been on several voyages of discovery, as they say, um, both about history and 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 about religion, um, uh, and and I got a greater appreciation for uh, the importance of religion, the the positive influences as well as negative, uh, and how they've how they have influenced life for people, uh, both in the Ottoman period and in the post Ottoman period. Um, yeah, that's that's that that's that's a kind of a broad brushed answer to your question, but um, well, it's yeah. a good is a good answer. Um, but did you ever wonder why history seemed like it was locking a piece of the other side? Like that that's been my I would say it's a conflict for a lot of people to try and understand like something that they might have been told might actually be the complete opposite way. Like we're told in America, you're the heroes in a sense, and I'm a, I'm a patriot at heart. I really am. But you start looking through, you're like, man, what are we using as an example of being a hero in a sense? Like I learned the real history of like Vietnam and all this stuff. And I'm like, well, how do we get the other thing? And it really hit me when I had a memory expert on the show. And he goes, you know, if you ask someone about like the war with Germany, you ask each country their what they remember about it. Everyone's got a different answer. We might have some significant battles that we'll know. Like, I think everyone here knows about Pearl Harbor. Everyone here knows about all these types of things. But then you ask the other side of that, they have a, you would think they would have the same memory. That would be their top examples. No, it's a completely different thing and probably a battle you've never heard of. And you start realizing that the history you're being told is the one that it's, I wouldn't say it's conforming. It's what they would call reforming, which is trying to make you convert to the idea. And it's like, well, I think it's important to know all aspects of everything because you have people now that are completely disconnected from a religion basically islam they don't want to know about it they get scared of it when they hear it and i'm like you can't be like that you kind of have to figure out and decipher what that is but that's just the way the history books are taught over here they're not teaching you a whole other thing and it's not learning the real history it's just understanding what else is going on there i mean you're being told from one side and the hardest thing for another person to do is to tell you the person they got in an argument with side mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> Well, um, yeah, the, my, my, um, yeah, every once in a while somebody asks me about, so, you know, what is it with history? Does history repeat itself? And, um, uh, you know, my answer is, you know, history never repeats itself because what went on at any, in any, you know, incident that you want to talk about was so complex that there is no way that they that those that that complexity of, of factors can be replayed in the same way at any other time and in any other place you know a, having a sense of, of of history uh may give you uh, you know a sense of uh, some some sense of well things are likely to go this way or if you do that that's likely to turn out badly but you can't, you, you know, know, knowing history, you can't predict the future. And that's, you know, kind of an answer that would apply to everything which, which you just said. All those incidents that you, that you <laughs> mentioned, plus any other you could mention, they're all so complex. And it's, it's, it's kind of like what I said about in trying to sum up the Ottoman Empire. It had its good points and its bad points. There, there is, there is, it's very rare that you can find any kind of significant incident or or event and and um, uh, have a really absolutely crystal clear picture of what went on. And uh, the, all observers are going to have a different picture of it. 
they're going, they're going to see some of it, but not everything that's going on. Um, you mentioned the Vietnam War. You, 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 you get one sense. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm old enough that I still have some vague memory of, of what, was, what it was like in the U.S. Uh, at the time of the Vietnam War. Um, but you talk to somebody at the time and they will have a, um, a perspective. And then you get the, you know, the, the general public view of, of the Vietnam War. And then you dig into, you talk to an historian who's, who's dug into the, all, the, all that you know, formerly secret documentation, which um, um, <coughs> previously was unavailable, and they're able to draw conclusions from it, and uh, you get a you get a much more complex picture. So, all the it, whenever you th want to talk about um, anything going on, it's never black and white. Yeah, we can we can talk about um, uh, Russia and Ukraine, which probably I shouldn't talk about just because it's it, it, it's a it's a highly emotive topic. But go ten years down the line, and you'll you'll probably get a more nuanced view, which is not black and white, um, about what went into that, um, you know, the triggering of that of that invasion. Um, you know, it's it. You know, this, but you know, this is what makes history always doable. You're always finding new stuff, new perspectives, voices that haven't been heard before that you can feed into the general picture and try and adjust that, 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 that general picture to um, um, achieve a little bit more of that, uh, you know, the gray tones that go between the black and the white. You mentioned um, off air about looking into like the politics. Did you ever examine the politics of like today's time just with the intersect of religion? Like if religion was such a powerful force, and it seemed like a lot of people would side their political choices probably with their identity that they have in their religion. I'm like, how fucking complicated is that to do today? Like there's a, a lot of people that, I mean, I would still say Christianity's up there, but I feel like a lot of people just don't want to go to church or they don't want to be a part of that whole thing. And it's like, I know a lot more people, and I think it's like 43% of the population that just doesn't know where to stand on the religious aspect of stuff. And it makes you question, I mean, look at the presidency in America. I don't know any atheist president. It's all religious people. And it's just like, well, why do we still do that? It's like, we know that's not the same anymore, but it's just like, you ask the question, why do we still do that? People go, I don't know. It just seems like the right thing to do. A nice, wholesome person. That's a Christian. It's like, why, why? <laughs> that's not crazy to ask. That's dumb to me. I don't know why we do that. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, well, well, I'm, I'm, I, yeah. If you're asking me to 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 explain um, some people's point of, points of view, I, you know, I'll, I'll probably get it wrong. But but um, again, a couple of of uh, responses to that with um, the idea of okay, you never you never find an atheist or at least a self declared atheist in the presidency, and probably very few members of Congress also. And yet the U.S. is uh, one of the very few atheistic or, 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 or non-denominational um, uh, states, governments, where the, where the state is not supposed to, um, you know, create a, you know, a state religion. Um, so the state is hands off when it comes to religious affairs. That's not the case anywhere in Europe, really. Um, uh, you know, secularism, you know, secular, a secular system of government, the US has it. And yet society is very religious. Um, and religion, the values of religion come into politics in a way that they don't in at least a large part of, of, of Europe, including the UK. Um, and why is that? A, yeah, there are real differences in you know the bottom up view of religion. Uh, the U.S. has always been, um, I would say, a more religious place, um, and that goes back to the early days when it was a place that that uh, religious dissenters headed to, so they could have the freedom to to practice religion as they wanted to, rather than under the control of an antagonistic government somewhere in Europe. Uh, so there's always been a you know, strong upward push from the population for, for religious values. 
or defensive religious values. But I think the nature of the state in the U.S. has also encouraged that. Um, because the U.S. state, and, and here my experience would be comparing the U.S. to the, to the U.K. government, the U.K. state. Um, and uh, the state here gets involved in, in all sorts of things that the, that the state in the U.S. never would. Because the the powers of the state in the U.S. they're they're, they're sharply limited by the uh, Constitution and, and the Bill of Rights. So I don't know, ten fifteen years ago, um, the Prime Minister of uh, of of the day here in Britain um, talked about wanting to introduce uh, for the population for the government to to implement an end of life strategy which for an American just seemed like such a bizarre. Wait, like euthanasia? Euthanasia? Yeah, well, well, no, well, well, well uh, uh, just, just that phrase just struck me as being, yeah, exactly. This is bizarre. Um, but what it, what it meant was, no, I'll you, well, maybe you, euthanasia for, for uh, uh, terminally old people might have been part of it. I, you know, I don't think it ever went anywhere, but the, but the idea was, a policy to um, make sure that people, as they near the end of their lives, uh, would have a uh, a comfortable existence. So, um, um, you know, care homes, hospices, and 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 you know, you would have care until the end of your life. Um, and you would never find anything like that in the U.S. Uh, that would be something that the U.S. government. You know, could not be involved in. Uh, you might, you know, you could theoretically find it at um, at state level, but but the U.S. government is a federal government, and it's limited in what can what it can be involved in, and it's and it and it has a very limited ability to get involved in those issues where religion has always been, uh, where churches and 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 um, you know religious institutions have always been, um, you know, very strong. You know, Looking after looking after the sick um, uh, and the poor, um, looking after people at the end of their lives, um, and so on. So you, you, if you're coming to the end of your life, you have a tendency. Maybe, you might have a tendency to think a little bit more about, well, is there a heaven? Um, uh, and a, and a state policy of of um, you know making sure your end of life is comfortable. You might it might reduce your your. Uh, your your urge to think about heaven is you know yeah, well okay things aren't so bad now and yeah well um it's because the pension go on as they are. the government yeah, wants their yeah. pension money they don't want to well, give well, you well, it yeah. <laughs> they, yeah well the government has a you know governments everywhere have a hand, hand in the pension money but but um uh yeah that's that's there's there's more scope for a vibrant religious community in the U.S. to be actively involved in the the the, the things that the charitable looking after the believer um, you know, communal life th th those things which have always been a, a strength of religion Christianity Judaism Islam all all of them uh, uh, do the same um, so I, I in the U.S. there is greater protection. For those who want to be religious, or greater room for people who want to be religious, than there is in uh, a place like the UK, um, or there's there's more point to it in the US than there is here. I think. I don't. I. I. I you probably weren't thinking we were going to end up talking really deeply into the religion thing, but I'm just fascinated at this point because I wonder. There's always this talk of separation between church and state. Everyone believes there should be that separation, and it seems like it does do that at some points. But I go. I think it's just visibly because I think they have the best relationship and it's the aspect of not letting people know that they have a relationship. The reason why I say that is if we talk about end of life, um, the government could easily care for people. We have enough time and money to help someone in their last month or something like that. But what do they not do? They don't. And you know where people turn to is religion. People get very, very religious towards the end of their death. I mean, even on their death. But I think I've had a couple of close calls where I was just like hugging the toilet after a night of Taco Bell. And I was like, oh, God, this is where I'm going to become religious, you know, and it's true. It's because of that 
aspect of things where you start realizing it's like what the government doesn't do, where do people usually turn to as another power and another one that's influential in our society? And that is the church. Even if they're not religious, most of their life, they'll turn there in their last moments. There's, they, they, they say it's that fear of not knowing what else is after there, which I think is a good quality and good example as well, too. But I also think it's just not wanting to be alone. Like if the government was there holding your hand in your last steps, you probably wouldn't think about religion. But since there's nobody there besides your family, you kind of prey on that religion aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. The um, uh, going a, a constitutional lawyer could tell you a lot more than I could. But 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 the powers of, of the U.S. government, the ability of the U.S. government to get into. <coughs> Things which are are um, uh, you know not within the traditional realm of of, uh, of state interest uh, is, is is very limited. Um, uh, I'm sure that there would be arguments, cases brought that would end up at the Supreme Court if if the if the U.S. government were ever to try to implement an end of life strategy. Um, it's just not within the the purview of of, of most of, of, of explicit purview of the U.S. government, and uh, if it's not within the purview of the U.S. government, then it's automatically devolved to the states, uh, the individual states. I mean, that's the that's the structure. Watch me stop paying taxes and see how quick that lands in their purview. Just watch. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, but 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 that, but that is part of their explicit. Purview to the, the, their their power to to to, to levy taxes, um, but not all taxes because of, of course a good chunk of it comes at, at state and local level. Uh, it's not it, it, the federal government is not the only government that matters, and for most people, uh, it's maybe not the, the the government that matters most. Um, which I, I we could we could get into a very interesting discussion of U.S. politics and how that's influenced by that fact. Um, um, but I think, I think that's the case. You think, um, more people probably identify with a religion today in, at least in the U S or do you think more people probably identify with their government? Cause that's what I've noticed. There's like the weird, like redneck people with the, you know, the sunglasses and the, the trucker hat or something. They're hardcore prop. Well, they're usually anti-government, but they're hardcore religious. And then like the people that are really in, in the government, they say that they're religious, but they probably identify more with their political party rather than they do their religion. And it's just like this weird branch off. And I guess, cause I'm on the outside cause I don't really care for politics. My whole idea is that like, if you assign yourself left or right, you're going to be less likely to look for the corruption on your own side. You're going to be more happy to point it out on the other side. So I go, I might as well play middle game and just be like, I'm not going to choose if there's evil, I'll notice evil. And it's like, but the religion thing too, I just can't get past to the afterlife thing. I was like, I don't know. I'm fine with just not being here anymore. That's cool with me. <laughs> um. Yeah. Okay. Well. Well. Um, yeah. The 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 parallel or the link between religious um, belief and 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 political leaning. Um, again, it's it 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 doesn't always just break one way. Um, so uh, there there there's a. Uh, Again, I'm probably probably straying into territory I shouldn't stray into because I don't know enough. But 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 I think there's a very strong stream of of evangelical Christianity that would look at um, a lot of the program of uh, shall we call it the left, which is about state support for those who are less well off, um, uh, you know, unemployment, medical care. Uh, if there were an end of life strategy, you know, what, what, whatever, um, uh, and and object to it because uh, for them, um, as part of an as part of a sense of what faith dictates for them to do, or what is regarded as being the ultimate good, the ultimate good is to. Um, uh, bring the light of Jesus to people who haven't accepted it yet. And, you know, as you, as you said, when it, came to, when, it, when, it, when, it, when it, when it, when it came to um, your scary incidents after Taco Bell, 
you know, when you, when, when you, when you're, when things are looking really black, that there, there's a greater likelihood that you, that you might accept, um, the, the light that is, um, uh, the light of Jesus. So if the state intervenes to prevent people by offering help to people so that they never reach a state where they, uh, where it's a come to Jesus moment, um, yeah, the, if the, if the state intervenes, then that is actually working against um, the mission, um, you know, the evangelical mission. Uh, and then you get, and then you get people who are in more established churches or you know, more hierarchical established churches who would uh, say, thinking about that uh, whole principle of uh, helping people, um, uh, helping helping the, helping the poor, the meek. Uh, the vulnerable, um, that it, it is very difficult to be a Christian and not to support those kinds of um, uh, you know, more left-leaning policies. You know, it, goes, it goes back to, well, when you talk about Christianity, which Christianity are you talking about? Is, and and um, you know, there, there are you know, voices on, on both sides. It's just ones that get heard tend to have the, more of that evangelical um, tone to them. Both sides, in my opinion, hijack it. And that each side likes to think that they own Christianity. But that's, that's just a weird thing I noticed when we were a kid. We say one nation under God. And any kid that hears that, they don't think really what that means. One nation under God. Does that mean they're not, God's not protecting every, do we own claim to God? Like it's those questions you start asking yourself. This is why I said, like, it's hard for me to fall down into the subject of it. Cause it seems like everyone can hijack it in a way. I think you mentioned it earlier about someone taking a problem to an Islamic court, if they're Islam, because it's more likely in their favor. I mean, that's preceding law. There's no, it's not about who's right or who's wrong anymore. It's just hoping that, you know, since, hey, we're on the same team, you'll go with my side of things. But that's how it works in a lot of aspects of things where you start wondering what the system is. I mean, if religion is as powerful as, you know, we're told it is and it's all these things. But then how come there's other things that somehow superseded or hijacked it in a sense? Like it becomes a narrative that can be flipped. And I think that's just weird to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that example of... Um... You know, the, uh, a Muslim wanting to take things to to, to an Islamic court. Um, it's not. Yeah, it's not just the Muslims always band together against the non-Muslims. Um, oh, it's every religion. I bet. Yeah, well, 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 well uh, you know, there there are things specifically to do with that instance, which actually are, you know, uh, legitimately part of 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 a legal code, which is Islamic in origin, but but um, uh, it, it isn't isn't terribly compatible with. Um, uh the way business was done um by by western merchants um <coughs> sorry i sort of got lost on 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 uh on what you were um uh ra raising there about um you know once, once once i got sidetracked onto that um well, I was I was just mentioning just the intersect of religion and it comes into government in a sense as well, too. It's like this flip flop topic, really. They're the, like I said, the president thing saying that they're Christian. Does that give them more votes? I mean, we some so that that's what I'm, that's weird to me. There's not really like you're you're capturing someone's identity all for what a populace of getting votes. Like it makes me question, do these people even believe what they're saying? Or is it just like when I see, you know, an advertisement company or a man, major manufacturer down here change their flag to or change their symbol to a rainbow flag and saying they support LGBTQ? Do they really? Or are they just trying to get on your side so they can, you can still buy their product? And you start realizing there's these sales pitches everywhere, and it starts to make you question more. And I, I think I don't know if people really believe that they 100% feel that way now. I don't. I can't. To me, it's just like no, that's the worst sales pitch I've ever seen. They just they don't care about you. like when Google says we're going to ban disinformation to keep you safe. I'm like Google doesn't care about me. They care about my attention span. <laughs> like yep, yep, yep. yeah. Yeah, no, no. Um, you know, I, 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 I would agree with you on all, <laughs> on all that. Um, yeah, you know, as there is, there is that great line which uh, uh, I think Reagan popularized about, well, or it was a Reagan era thing of, of how can you tell when a politician is lying it's when you see his lips moving. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there, there, yeah, you, 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 you can't run for for any kind of office above the level of dog catcher without um at least paying some kind of lip service to um 
religious values uh, or, or, or to religion, because that is a statement of uh, you accept a, you know, the, the source of what is right and what is wrong, um, and that you share that source with, with people who um, uh, are potential voters for you. And you uh, will, will offend secularists and atheists, but you will be reassuring to twice as many um, people of faith. And, it, and it, it's not necessarily just Christians. And, and um, you know, I think actually the big divide is much more between those who uh, profess a religion in politics and those who don't. Um, you know, a friend, a friend of mine from way back when, a Muslim, um, um, it was you know, came from came from Georgia, um, and the neighbors all wanted to know what he what he believed in and and or, or what his family believed in. And when when they said, you know, we're we're, we're Muslim, uh, we believe in Islam, you know, the reaction basically the reaction was, um, oh, so you're Muslim. Okay, well, at least you're not at least you're not atheists. You know, as long as you believe in something, as long as you believe in God, you might be wrong on some details, but fundamentally, you're sound. If you say you don't believe in anything, yeah, that's that's that's, that's, that's rough. That's what gets me. Is it just the comfortability notion? Does it make people feel safe? Like if a president says, I, you know, I'm a Christian president, or if they say that they're atheists, it's, it's like that fear, like that weird part where it's like, okay, you agree with me to a point that there is a God, but we don't agree on the minor details. And then I bet you over the time period, they will dispute some of those minor details and try and people just are subjected to changing someone into their way of thinking. And I'm like, it's not necessarily about that anymore. Like, it's kind of more about just learning the other thing and, you know, deciding, let, let people. This whole abide thing, it's not like a, you know, it's not like a human quality for people to have because we like what we like and we don't want change on that aspect of things. And that's what makes me go through the historical record on things. I'm like, OK, I'm learning the story this way, but then you have an irrational fear towards communism. Well, what is that irrational fear coming from? And you start realize it's because they're telling you I'm on your side and you have to fear this thing that we fear. So now we're on the same team. That means this is both our enemy. And it's like, well, look into it and you start realizing it's not like that at all. And then that's like the danger stuff for me where I'm like, I mean, would you recommend for people to get interested into the Ottoman Empire just to look at it from like an open glance or a non-biased point of view? I'm guessing it has to be a controversial topic, to, despite if you agree with the historical record or not. I mean, I'm guessing the majority is it probably fell to power because it was just overcroached too much. But then if you probably look at the underlying factors of it, there's probably a whole different type of thing that's going on there as well too um it's uh yeah um find, uh, re recommending any any book to read that would be manageable in length and um uh really easy to read um is a is a little is a little bit of a challenge um yeah there was a um there was a book that came out about 15 years ago now, maybe, by Caroline Finkel called Osman's Dream, um, which I've used in, in classes and, and the first term students struggled with it. And then all of a sudden something clicked and it, and it really worked for them. But that's a, a thick book. Um, but another one that that would be interesting to look at much more recently, but also a, a thick book, is by Gabor Agoston. Um, uh, A G O S T O N is the last name. Called, I think, the Mas last Muslim conquerors, um, and that is that's also um, uh, pretty good. Um, there, are, yeah, but 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 there there are more histories of the Ottomans coming out. But it's such a huge place and such a great length of time that not everything can be covered adequately or 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 correctly. If you look up on um, YouTube, people can do it in 10 minutes. I saw that on YouTube. It was a 10 minute overview of the Ottoman Empire. And someone commented like, I, I like to see the person that can cover 600 years in 10 minutes. <laughs> it's just, I was like, it's true. There's a lot there. And it gets a lot gets lost in details. I mean, I'd like this. I think when it comes to a book and even if it has Muslim on the title, 
there's not an area of uninterest. There's an area of disinterest. And that's what I don't like is like, why does that word immediately want people to put the book down? Like if you're not of that faith or something like that. And it's this misunderstanding concept that I'm trying to get, you know, trying to understand all the perspectives of stuff. Like I said, everyone's got a different historical memory and everyone's got a different cultural identity. And it's like understanding that kind of side of it, but it's new and that's scary, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you, you asked me a quite a while ago now that uh, about uh, yeah, things, things that I've discovered and, and change, you know, changes that I've had in, in the way I see things. And uh, when I started out in, in studying history and studying the Middle East and, and the Ottoman Empire, um, I still, yeah, I, I had that, that, I felt that expectation that is drummed into people who study Ottoman things um, and the Middle East in general, that you cannot talk about Islam or you cannot take Islam at face value. Uh, it's always a, you know, it's a, when anybody talks about Islam and your sources, they're really talking about something else. It's just an, you know, a, a, a way of speaking about something which is of much more personal interest. And, um, you know, finding, uh, finding anybody writing about the Ottoman Empire or talking about the Ottoman Empire who's uh, willing to really, um, uh, you know, take up Islam as a, as a serious topic. It's a you know, pretty limited field. And so I'm not terribly surprised if that's the case for those who are writing about it. For those who might be reading about it, not a great deal of interest either. You know, whether, whether you know, it, it, it's, it's a repellent idea, as you were kind of su suggesting, or a matter of, I don't care, uh, one way or the other. It's it's not something that people really want to know more about precisely because of all those uh, assumptions about what it means to be Muslim, which is based upon 9-11 and, and the Iranian revolution and everything else bad that has come out, everything else violent that's happened that has been done in the name of religion um, over the past 30, 40, 50 years. Um, uh, but as I say, you know, if you, if you if you keep at it, and you dig a little deeper and you find out that actually there's, there's some really interesting nuance that you might be able to get out of it. Um, you're not going to get it all at once in, in, in about this or anything else, but, but, but at least to find out a little bit more so you can think about it a little bit more. You've definitely got me uh, thinking a little bit differently. I mean, like I said, I was very new to the Ottoman Empire. Like I said, it's not really something a lot of people take away from history class. Um, but I'm going to definitely look into it a little bit more. But I really appreciate the time you've given me, Fred, to talk on my show, man. Um, is there a place where people can find your links? Do you have any links on Twitter or anything like that? Um, <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I've not yet learned to tweet. Good for you. Good for you. I'm afraid to say or, or, or embarrassed to say. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, I mean, if, you, if you're determined, you can um, – Look me up on uh, the Birkbeck website, which is www.bbk.ac.uk slash history, and I'll be in there. Um, and I've got a company of a handful of academic paper, more academic papers um, available on academia.edu. Um, and if you're interested, I'm always happy to send, you know, PDFs of, of things if you, if you're, if you, if you want to know more. Please do for me. I definitely want to know more. Send me some more. Um, but I'm going to link all your links in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting, and thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank.